Okay. Hello, good evening, everyone. I can see people joining in more and more. So I will start talking to cut the time. Uh, my name is Pavla Niklova, and I'm the executive director of the Václav Havel Library Foundation. I'd like to welcome you at the spring weekend of stage readings, a part of the Rehearsal for Truth Theatre Festival honoring Václav Havel. The festival is produced by the Havel Foundation in partnership with Bohemian Benevolent and Literary Association. So uh, I will keep talking for a while to give a chance for people who who are applauding our healthcare workers and first respondents in New York City because it's seven o'clock. I can also hear it in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, so I'll, I'll keep giving my little speech and then we will start. Um, I'd like uh, to thank all of you for joining us. Um, I'm sorry we can't welcome you at the Bohemian National Hall where we normally hold our events, but I'm very lucky that we were able to change the spring weekend for Zoom. For that, I would like to thank all the wonderful directors, actors and panelists who have joined us to to flip the event in this challenging circumstances. One of our main goals is to start new partnerships between European and American theater. And we are so happy that we have been joined by wonderful actors and um, theater professionals. And uh, we are dedicated to keep doing this work. And we can't wait uh, to see you guys back on stage. I know it must be a very difficult time for you. I would like to thank uh, New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and Council Member Ben Carlos for their continuous support of our programs. Our events are usually free, but with the spring weekend, we have decided to raise funds to buy art supplies for children from public schools in Elmhurst, Queens, one of the worst hit neighborhoods by COVID-19. Um, these children can't go to school. Quite often they can't go outside because they have to quarantine because somebody from their family is sick. So thank you very much for the support that you can give. I know, thank you so much to all of you who have already contributed. You've been very generous. You can contribute when you register for tomorrow's play or from the main website of the Havel Foundation at bhlf.org. Thank you so much. I'd like to ask you to also check our new festival website, Rehearsal for Truth, to find out more about tomorrow's play. It's a play by Polish-American playwright Martina Majok. Her, the play is called Cost of Living, and it received 2018 Pulitzer Prize Award for Drama. Um, I have a few technical remarks. Uh, we are using the webinar of Zoom. So unfortunately, we can't see the audience, but we know that you are with us. Uh, we have a lot of audience. We have something like 80, 80 people with us watching. This is so nice of you that you uh, selected us, that you, you know, that you preferred us to beautiful walk outside. We are very grateful. Tonight, we are going to see a play called The American Emperor. It's based on a documentary novel by Austrian writer Martin Pollack and adapted for a stage by Slovak writer Michal Dite. Uh, the play tells stories about people from poor neighborhoods, from poor regions in Eastern Europe at the end of the 19th century who decide to pursue their dreams and set on a difficult journey to America. The play is also a metaphor for any immigrants who decide to leave their countries and uh, for political safety or economic reasons. And uh, for me, especially these days, the play is also a metaphor for people who live in this country, but somehow they still can't reach its shores. And that's why we'd like to dedicate tonight's reading to all those people who keep fighting for a fair chance 
for a better life and justice. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce the director who you can see on your screen. Uh, Jackie de Villiers is a South African award-winning actor, director, and playwright now living in New York City. Some of her highlights include I Love You, You're Perfect, Now Change, Macbeth, An Unromantic Comedy, and Boy Meets Boy. She received various awards, including New Female Playwrights Award, as well as Search for a New Place Writers Grant. Recently, she directed Clouds Like Waves at New York Winterfest and Lost Property at Jersey City Theater Center. She was a resident director of the international production of the Broadway musical Hairspray in South Africa. She also collaborated with Spitfire Company in Prague. She contributes to New York Theater Guide and Stage Biz in NYC. So um, I hope that you have a nice drink or, uh, <laughs> or a nice cup of coffee. And, uh, enjoy the play and over to Michaela. Martin Polak, The American Emperor. Galician Tower of Babel with Polish, Ukra Ukrainian, Austrian, German, Jewish, Ruthenian, and Slovak people. Matthias Komara, Pan Popo Pal Popovic, Jan Virostek, Jakub Komara, Simon Herz, Maria Komarová, Maria Virostek, Johanna Virostek, Johan Popovic, Maciej Komar, Johan Virostak, Anna Popovičová, Janos Popovic, Mihály Popovic, Josef Klausner, Johannius Popovic, Georgius Popovic, Catherine Popovičová, Agata Popovičová, Anna Pavlíková, Mendel Beck, Abraham Feld, Hersch Springler, Hersch Lokšpajze, Josel Vrabok, Abraham Feld, Hersch Springler, Krenčia Salterová, Hanna, Anna Strasbergová, Adam Křivanovský, Anna Feldmanová, Hanna Ruhalter, Lexor Hecht, Salomon Redlich, Rubin Rabinovič, Bersa Papenheim, Sara Rabinovičová, August Römer, Mária Blumová, Anna Kovalová, Paranka Maximišinová, Lea Muncová, Malgorzata Falkievič, Ivan Franko, Stanislav Štepanovský, Michal Janiševský, Maciel Beherič, Celiglej Kupferman, Katarzyna Leniec, Ruchel Baufol Špinerová, Moritz Hirsch, Moritz Friedländer, Jakob Haberfeld, Henoch Henberg, Henrich Ogniewski, Moritz Friedländer, Jakob Haferbelt, Josef Lej, Vladislav Svolkien, Nathan Kuperman, Hermann Zeitinger, Bernard Kuperfan, Vincent Zwilling, Jakub Klausner, Julius Better, Jonas Better, Chiela Better, Julius Neumann, Rosalia Wachtelová, Hersch Mendel, Mihani Koperan, Josef Schröner, Maximilian Wilder, Mendel Beck. The Legend. In the middle of an era, Slavitz was born. The Countess Radana was his mother. The fiery dragon fathered him. The child grew into adulthood, growing stronger and wiser. He saw that coexistence with dragons was no good. Slavitz grew to become a dragon killer. He wished to free humans of tyranny, incessant arson, and fear. Each evening, he crept out from home, tirelessly killing the dragons that met their end under his sword. Nonetheless, a midnight fight occurred in which Slavitz was wounded. He found refuge in a cave. Snake brought him medicinal herbs, wolf licked his wounds, and Mamuna, one of the forest fairies, brought him spring water. His desperate mother was looking for him, though, to no avail. In the night, in the forest, Hawk came to her to tell her what happened. Radina came to hate Slavitz, for he had betrayed his own father. She sent a curse upon her son, and the entrance to the cave closed. Slavitz died there in solitude. One night, as Radina slept in her bed, Slavitz's snake sneaked in and bit her breasts. Insane, Radina wandered aimlessly between the rivers of Neper and Vistula. Drops of snake poison dripped from her breasts. Earth grew black. Poisoned herbs grew from the soil. 
meat from the cattle was inedible and no year brought sufficient harvest. Cattle ate the bitter herbs and people kept dwelling the poisoned land. Evil from the poisoned land penetrated human blood. They no longer found inner peace. The same was the fate of every generation of offspring that wished to farm the cursed land. Shortly before departure to America, Mendel Beck with his sister Rifke. When my train reaches Podgorja by Krakow, I shall get off and continue by carriage to Zabierzov. From there, by train to Chalmek and on foot to Yabishovice. It's just a few miles. There, I can again get on a train to Oshvienshi. I will buy a black coat to look decent. I shan't travel straight to the agent, but will take a detour by a Krakow, Cherov, Prague, and Magdeburg. I will keep getting tickets only for each leg of the journey, and I shall take a fast train to Cherov. I'm allowed to take the fourth class all the way to Magdeburg. If they ask me before I reach Krakow about my destination, I, I shall answer that I am going to Krakow. Once I am past Krakow, I shall say that I am heading for a business visit in Prague. Once past Prague, I can travel freely. I will no longer even need passport. When my train reaches Podgorja by Krakow, I continue on the carriage to Zabierzov. From there, by train to Chalmek and on foot to Yavishovice. It's just a few miles. There I can again get on the train to Oshvienshi. I will buy a black coat to look decent. I'm allowed to take the fourth class all the way to Magdeburg. If they ask me before I reach Krakow about my destination, I shall answer that I am going to Krakow. Once past Krakow, I shall say that I am heading for a business visit in Prague. Once past Prague, I, I can travel freely. I will no longer even need passport. Are you leaving? When my train reaches Podgorja by Krakow, I shall get off and continue by carriage to Zabierzov, from there by train to Chalmek, and on foot to Yavishovice. It's just a few miles. There I can again get on a train to Oshvienshim. I will buy a black coat to look decent. I shan't travel straight to the agent, but will take a detour by a Krakow, Cherov, Prague, and Magdeburg. I will keep getting tickets only for each leg of the journey, and I shall take a fast train to Cherov. I'm allowed to take the fourth class all the way to Magdeburg. If they ask me before I reach Krakow about my destination, I shall answer that I am going to Krakow. Once past Krakow, I shall say that I am heading for a business visit in Prague. Once past Prague, I can travel freely. I will no longer even need to ask You are leaving. When my train reaches Podgorja by Krakow, I shall get off and continue by carriage to Zabierzo from there by train to Chalmek and on foot to Yabishovice. Where are you going? It's just a few miles. There I can again get on a train to Oshvienshim. I will buy a black coat to look decent. I shan't travel straight to the agent, but will take a detour by a Krakow, Cherov, Prague, and Magdeburg. That's far. I will keep getting tickets only for each leg of the journey, and I shall take a fast train to Cherov. I'm allowed to take the fourth class all the way to Magdeburg. If they ask me before I reach Krakow about my destination, I shall answer that I am going to Krakow. Once past Krakow, I shall say that I am heading for a business visit in Prague. Once past Prague, I can travel freely. I will no longer even need passport. That's far. Be quiet, Rivke. I mustn't make a mistake. Otherwise, the gendarmerie sends me back and I can forget all about America. Whereabouts is that America? Just past London, to the left, on the sea. I'll go too. Will you take me along? <laughs> You're too small for America. Let me be now. I am not small. I know plenty. America is greedy. She took away all healthy men from Vlisk. Women plow fields, cut grass in the meadow, milk cows, give birth, drink in pub. Letters keep coming from America, but who is it who writes them? None of the men knew how to write. They all got lost there. You too will get lost. You won't come back. You will leave and we die. I'll send dollars. If you leave, they will marry me off in the summer. If you leave, they will marry me off in the summer to the old pub master in Sanuk. Or even worse, they sold off Maria Volchek 
for 300 golders to a businessman from Chenetsky. She was this 13. A letter arrived from Constantinople saying she is well and happy. Don't leave, Mendel. I beg you, don't leave. I don't want to end up in Sinuk or Constantinople either. I'll earn some dollars in America and we'll send them over. If I earn enough, you will buy a shop with mixed goods. Father and mother will sit on a bench in front and you will be at the counter. I don't want any shop. Do stay. I've got to leave this place, Rivkin. It is 25 April, 1888 today. I shall walk to Shemishul. Two companions, Hersh Springler and Yosel Rabak from Baligrad, will join me on the way. This year, 75,000 people are leaving from Galicia. I am one of them, Mendel Beck. The anti-Semite. Jew. Jew. The administration of the assets in Krasichin offers police, farms, and pubs for Christians only. Bidders apply at the main office of the Khan Sapieha in Krasichin. Jew. Looking for a Christian administrator of a 330 hectares farm based on fine soil in the district of Horedenka. You don't lend land to Jews. Don't shop with Jews. Jew. Jew is our misfortune. Away with the leeches. Jew. Here is the American translator. We were inspired to publish the American translator by the general request for similar publication by our countrymen living in America. The aim of the translator is to serve as an instrument for Slovak Americans as well as locally based Hungarian Slovaks so that they might acquire the most useful knowledge of English language without which one cannot progress in America. Hence, the interpreter is quite comprehensibly and simply written. The first lesson can be about the parts of human body so that a person living in America knows how to pronounce where they hurt or can describe to another person. Let's memorize. Head. Head. Skull. Skull. Brains. Brains. Forehead. Forehead. Face. Face. Eye. Eye. Eyebrow. Eyebrow. Eyelash. Eyelash. Ear. Ear. Temple. Temple. Nose. Nose. Ear. Ear. Mouth. Mouth. Lips. Lips. Tooth. Tooth. It is very good to memorize. Even repeat ten times like our Father who art in heaven. Head. Head. Skull. Skull. Brains. Brains. Forehead. Forehead. Face. Face. Eye. Eye. Eyebrow. Eyebrow. Lash. Eyelash. Tear. Tear. Temple. Uh, tem uh. Temple. Temple. Nose. Nose. Ear. Ear. Mouth. Mouth. Lips. Lips. Tooth. Tooth. We shall continue next week with pains. Headache, throat ache, chest pain, stomach ache, earache, backache, stroke, chills, swelling, toothache, broken bone, pneumonia, cold, and cramp. A man may be able, capable, or learned, but when he does not speak languages, he is, despite the givens, unable to prove his qualities. That will cause that nobody entrusts him with responsible service. When one wants to progress in America, he has to be, in any case, 
able to express himself in English language. It is true that learning is hard at first, but goodwill will overcome all difficulties. Rivka Beck is writing to Mendel Beck a letter that was never written and never sent. Mendel, are you there yet? No. I wrote you a letter. You can't write, Rivka. I wrote it anyway. All right. I'll read it when I come. You can't read, Mendel. I'll read it anyway. You won't. I couldn't send it to you. You did well. No need to waste money on letters. I saved up. I went to the office and sent it off. Then I shall read it. You won't. The clerk told me that it didn't reach you. Apparently, it isn't enough to write Mendel back America. It might get lost there. He advised you well. Waste of money. He told me to buy sugar instead. It's sweet. Mendel? Yes, Rivke. Will we keep sugar in our shop? <laughs> There'll be sugar too. Just that I've got to make the dollars. Rivke. Yes, Mendel? What did you write to me? You left and I started looking at the world. I discovered that it is not a nice world. I see people with bent backs from working the fields. I see that people eat the same meal day after day, morning, lunch, and dinner. The same stuff all around, either milk, soup, or barley. Breakfast differs from lunch in that it is eaten in the morning. I see a woman dragging a plow, though it is to be towed by a horse or another pulling animal. Then I see mothers licking off pus from their children's eyes, for there is no medication here for such conditions. And I also see how they shave their children's head and cover with petroleum. I also see young women who had a massive belly just yesterday, but today they don't calm their baby in a cot. <sighs> Children disappear here. People say that they only go to good people, but I see it isn't so, for I keep looking at the world ever since you left. The good people don't do that out of love for the neighbor. I see they don't. The young girls' families leave money to the good people. They say it's to help the good people take care of the babies, to have something to start with. Mendel, I know that isn't the case. There are no good people. Good people don't give a child two handfuls of pine needles to suffocate. Good people don't leave a child to freeze in the backyard. They say the good people are the creators of angels and things are the way they ought to be. I see thousands of Jewish families escaping from Russia. Some say they keep escaping, for if they don't, they get killed. Others say everything is all right, for they are Jews and Jews are to keep escaping. We too will have to run like that, Mendel. I do know. I don't want to keep looking at it all, but I have to. I look at the world ever since you left and see it is no pretty world. Don't leave me here. Like Double-Headed Eagle, a portrait of the Emperor Francis Joseph I and the President Grover Cleveland, six-handed clerk at the Oshvienchim Immigration Authority, keeps writing documents, drinks coffee, translates documents, stamps documents, telegraphs, gestures. 28 April, 1888. The journey across Poland didn't go quite to the plan. I stood helplessly at the Oshvienchim train station I didn't escape the looks of the police patrol that took me away to the Hotel de Zatar. It was nothing special. At the same time, they were taking other people away from the station, not just men, but also women and children. Foreigners whom no one understood. We all ended up in the hotel lobby. No one knew what was to happen to us next. My journey to America ended on the border with Prussia. Name was Sanem. Mendel Beck. Date of birth? 21 February 1863. Place of birth? Lisek by Shemishil. So, what shall we do with you, Mendelbeck of Lisk? 
I want to go to America. I want to earn dollars so that my family can buy a mixed good shop. I want my father and mother to sit on a bench in front and my sister to be at the counter selling peasants and farmers everything they need. Can you read? No. Can you write? No. Another an alphabet. Do you think America needs those? What is it you actually do? Repair shoes. I can repair shoes. You can continue repairing shoes. But at home, not in America. You have your hat sack, one shirt, matzos, family photograph, and 66 golders. Coincidentally, 66 golders is the sum which we are selling today ship tickets for America. 66 golders for a single ticket? We send you back to the River Sun. Until you think about it, I will ring the shipping company whether there is actually place left on the ship. Yeah, Simon has. I should like to inquire whether there is still any place left on the ship. Oh, it's full up. How inconvenient. Next one is due in one year's time. Oh. Who? Oh, well, I've got Mendelbeck of Lisk in my office. Uh, he is decent, subtle, yeah, easy to fit in. No luggage. Yeah. Oh, one place can be found indeed. Certainly. I will tell him. Will I be going to America? For 66 golders. For 66 golders? Can, can I go now? Well, no rush. I've still got to telegraph the American emperor whether he takes you into his empire. Pretty moody. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, yeah, here is Simon Hurd. Yeah, I am from Exit. Yes, from East. Oh, <laughs> I, I do not have to speak in American. Oh, okay, thank you. I want to ask your transoceanic majesty whether you accept in your country Mendelbeck of Lisk. Yes, I will ask him. You spoke about me with the American emperor? He has to know everyone traveling in his empire. It is an American tradition. Today is your lucky day. Telegraph to Hamburg in America costs only five golders. The ticket price of 66 golders for the ship includes overnight stay in Hamburg. Uh, here is the address. Louis Fries, Immigrant House, Neumannstraße 22, Room and Board. Small token from your immigration agency. The ship departs on 50 April. Take a jumper. It gets cold on the ship. Our office charges four golders for the medical checkup. You can go to the doctor in the city, but that will cost you at least 15 golders. <laughs> I will give you a discount on travel documents. No worries about that. <laughs> you can get them for two golders per page. America was at the tips of my fingers. I was left with the remaining few coins to cross the ocean. I believe no more than dollars roll on the streets of America. I want it to be so. For the next three days, I was making my way to Hamburg. I got to Normanstrasse, showed them my ship tickets and asked about the room I was promised for, for I have already paid the room and board at the emigration agency. The landlord just laughed and shook his head. He grabbed six golders for a night in a stinky cupboard with a single bed. An emergency, others have to do with a bag of hay on the floor. He wanted extra for the meal, so I rather gave that up. And now, Bertha Pappenheim, Austrian Jewish feminist and social pioneer. The expansion of white meat trade is directly linked to immigration. Mass immigration is only natural from a country unable to feed its own. Utter ignorance and incredible gullibility only fuel public readiness to leave. People have no idea whatsoever 
of geography. They have no clue whether America might be a city by London and how long it takes to get somewhere. They can't read or write. They don't receive any news or letters. They are unable to double check anything. No wonder each girl that takes off and leaves her hometown exposes herself to all kinds of accidents and evil whilst yet in her homeland. Jewish girls hand great many newborns to peasant women who turn them into angels. Rail Yard, New York. Matthias Komara and John Doe seek employment. Uh, uh, boss, boss, I, 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 I look work. Can they give work for I? Do they have work for me? Well, what can you do? Uh, I do know every work. Uh, I know outside work. Have you ever worked on the railroad? Yes, sir. I worked rail the last uh, two years. I need a man who understands how to blast a rock. I know drill and make good do with powder of gun and dynamite. And, and I work in stone crushing place also. Well, you can commence to work in the morning. Uh, but uh, I have 10 uh, countrymen. We want all work yet for us. I, I need about a dozen laborers. Uh, well, I think they will know how to do the metal and shovel. They will quick know for sure we're all very good workers. Well, then tell them to come in a body tomorrow morning. Uh, I'm, I'm set to speak. We know come in morning possible, not be here. Well, why not? We sleep 15 miles from this place. We must find home for us here. All right. Uh, how much do sir uh, pay for one day working? We pay one dollar and fifty cents. How much hours uh, we must work one day? You'll have to work ten hours every day. Uh, how many time work will long? It will last um, ten months or one year. Uh, how often, sir, pay? Oh, payday is twentieth of every month. Oh, my dream don't say such. Hey, hey, Pals, come, come, grab Metox. The soil must be leveled, and, and that hole must be filled. The mound must be destroyed. Uh, load the soil on the wheelbarrow. Handle the metal well, so you fit in. Do your work as you ought to. You have to exert more pressure. It's job for dollar. Flashback to Mendel's ship crossing. The 20 bodies, 40 hands and 40 legs. Limbs stick out in every direction at all the levels. Mendelbeck is squeezed among them. 30 April, 1888. We are leaving Hamburg on the Suevia steamer, heading for Le Havre. The voyage to America is to take 14 days. Suevia is an old and rusty steamer with a single chimney and two masts. When sat on the water back in 1874, it was to take alone a hundred people in the first class, 70 in the second, and 600 in the third class, that is on the second deck. Nonetheless, we were there over a thousand, largely European emigrants from Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Russia, and Austria. Many Austrians come from Galicia and Greater Hungary, People of all ethnic and faith groups and languages who can hardly understand each other are squashed together. Women, men, children, a, a colorful medley whilst only washing rooms and toilets are separated and uh, look indescribable within minutes. I have to force myself to swallow food at all. The, the food I bought before leaving Hamburg the food is being dished out by crew member from a massive pot into iron bowls. My companions, Herr Springler and Yossel Rabok, religious Jews, wouldn't touch the food for it's not kosher. 
They just roll their eyes when seeing their friends stirring the nondescript brew with large spoon. And they rather use their own stock, matzos, bread, onion, and tea, which is actually sugared hot water with a drop of mulled wine for a touch of flavor. In any case, they are seasick almost all the time and can hardly keep anything in. I bought metal dishes and a small flask in Hamburg, the flask allegedly being the panacea for seasickness. As a matter of fact, it is the cheapest room that I cannot take in even with the greatest effort. Poorly lit rooms with low ceilings filled with bunk beds, leaving narrow aisles in between. They all stink with human smell and gases, unwashed clothes, human bodies, food gone off, vomit, urine, and excrements. Everyone finds a job in America. There are houses that reach all the way to the clouds. There are as many people in a single house as there are in the entire Galician village, so the neighbors don't even know each other by name. Streets are as long as one cannot see the other end. And they are always filled with people who are crowded and, and shout in all kinds of languages. Some are as black as night, with black face and hands. And everyone rushes somewhere. Children's stories. D those are no fairy tales. I saw the houses on pictures and heard the letters read. The houses didn't get built by themselves. Are you bricklayer? No, I repair shoes. You should have stayed home, Galician. The ironworks and railways need men, no wimps. Americans throw shoes, old shoes away, and they buy new ones. You're heading in the wrong direction. If you wanted to fix souls, you should have gone to Moscow. I'm on the ship to America. I am heading in the right direction. On the ship? This ain't no ship. This is a whale. We are in the belly of an iron whale, my friend. Could there be such stench on the ship? No. When the whale ate us up back in Hamburg, no one let out a sound. I would swear some were even happy to see it. The whale tests our survival skills. She could be sailing straight across the Atlantic all the way to America. But she doesn't. She turns here and there. She digs deep into the great depths of the sea. And then she jumps into the air. She does everything to test us. Some vomited out their entire homeland. Some even five times over. Nothing was left in them. That is what she wants. We must be emptied and tired. And then she spits us out in America and we'd be happy to be alive. You take any job just for pittance, just so you don't have to get back in her belly. The veil whips her giant tail, turns around and she sails back to get more food. She's greedy. The whale? America, Galicia, America. Just look ahead of you. Is that New York? New city of new world. I'm standing on the deck of a ship. It's drizzling. The squealing seagulls are diving into the muddy river. If my folk in Lisk saw me standing here on the shore of America, <laughs> ginormous female figure sticks out of the water. Ah, Statue of Liberty. I can clearly discern the outline of the harbor and sky rises that reach all the way to the horizon, those of which I have heard so much back home. I did manage. On Monday, 14 May, 1888, I reach my destination. The Statue of Liberty. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is imprisoned lightning and her name, Mother of Exiles. 
From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that Twin Cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your poor, your tired, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, the tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. I don't like your way of working. I see no progress in it. Hurry up! Do not look around. Boss, boss, they must give man a chance to, to catch air and lung. Well, here's the, there, there's no time for taking rest. B boss, that's monster hard work. No man can live in such hurry work. I, I am so tired. I am exhausted. I, I must stop working, boss. Boss, I am no condition to work more in well, such hurry job. Well, go home and come in the morning. No, I no wish to come in morning. Well, why not? Uh, they, they too much want from worker. They want work to kill man. Workers obligated to observe health. Do they have time? I ask to pay. I want to know when sir pays me. Here's your time. How, how quick can I have money? You will get it on the next payday. But I no wait here. I must find me work other place. Well, I needn't. Rivka's plight. The man was in Lisk for just two days and the entire town knew of him. He was allegedly looking for a wife to travel with across continents. He spoke English, French, Arabic. It is allegedly like to speak Polish, but backwards. The next day, half of the men from the town could speak Mohammedic, though only in a pub after the 10th round of Polinka. The man came to our house. He followed me all the way from the square. He pursued me like a predator chasing its prey against the vin with silent step. You are pretty. A shame to keep you here, don't you think so? I can get to know the world, Varna, Egypt, Brazil, or Argentina. Mendel, have you ever danced tango? You haven't. There I could dance morning to evening. I've got a record player in Buenos Aires. Do you know what record player is? <laughs> you don't. He is on the road the entire year. He saw all cities. Even black people, a pyramid, an automobile. Me too could see all of that. Waste of me in this den. I belong in the big world. He would introduce me to the Tsar of India, should I wish. In India, everyone walks in white. Do you know why? For they have summer all year. White lace dress would suit me. I could have one like that. He would buy it for you, should I be his wife. Rivki Redlick, I've got to hurry. He must set off for Singapore tomorrow. The wedding must be today yet. Berha Pappenheim has the last word. No! One can trade chickens or boots, but not girls. Flashback to Mendel's arrival at Ellis Island. Admission to the United States is banned to the ill and sickly, retarded, mentally ill, and epileptics. I want to work. I want to work. I want to earn dollars so that the, our family can buy a corner shop. I want my father and mother to sit on a bench outside and my sister to sell to peasants and farmers all they need. Admission is banned to persons without funds and those who might be expected to seek social subsidies from public funds. I just want to work and earn dollars. 
The admission is banned to persons who committed crime or live a moral life as prostitutes or persons who incite prostitution or bring prostitutes over for such purposes in the United States. I just want to work. We ban entry to men who approve of polygamy and those who aim to violently take over. I have been in the isolation ward on the island for two weeks now. The, the doctor checks me every day. He, he uses an iron hook to lift my eyelids. I thought I would be working in America, but I am just copying strange images. Everyone just shakes their head. I don't understand anything. I must lay all day. I can walk for an hour. I must draw for three hours. <laughs> there is a sea behind the fence of the isolation board and the land behind the sea, it isn't far. One could swim across. Some tried. At night they climbed the fence, but to no avail. They were caught and shipped back home the next day. <laughs> they, made, they made a mark with chalk on my back. I, I don't know what it means. I have the last golder in my pocket. There isn't a single dollar lying on the ground, and no roast chicken has fallen to me like manna from the heaven. America is altogether different. Rifka's Plight, Part 2 Where are you, Mendel? In America. You haven't written. Everyone sends a letter, but virtually nothing has come from you. I couldn't, but I will drop you a few lines. Soon. I'll be waiting every day. How are things in Lisk? Drought. It hasn't rained ever since you left. Our neighbor's cow died. We'll be short of milk. Some people died, some were born. And home, how are things at home? And, and home, uh, how are things at home? home? And, and home, how, how are things at home? I don't know, I'm not home. I'm in hiding. What are you hiding from and where? Where, Rivke? I ran away to the woods of Pavlisk to escape a man. He wanted to take me to Rosalia, to Orantine, or to hell. He was a devil, Mendel. He was seducing me with sweet talk and wanted to take me to places where I couldn't fight him. I had to escape. I know where such men take young ladies. I wouldn't have come back, I know it. They say that girls from Galicia fare better with such men, that though they suffer much pain, they're happier there than at home. They told me that I was ready to bear the pain, that it was nothing, that women are born with such fate. Hurts her no matter in which corner of the world and how many times a day. I shan't be sharing my pain. I won't venture out to the wide world to seek happiness with the devil. I stay here in the wood upon Lysik. I ran from Lysik down our secret path so he wouldn't find me. I walked in the river so that he would lose my trace. I took off my clothes so he wouldn't be able to smell me. I know that when I return home, our father will beat the hell out of me for his money was sitting on the table. But you will send the dollars and he will forget all about it. We will buy the next good shop. Father and mother will sit on the bench outside and will buy a cow to have enough milk as soon as you send a letter and the dollars. Promise to write soon. Do promise me, Mendel. I'll write. I promise to write. An improvised fireplace in a barrel. Thick coats, gloves, fluffy hats, a bottle of palinka and a loaf of bread are changing hands somewhere in America. No, 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 no. Lead is poison that ruins your health forever. People who work on lead foundry are digging their grave. Some people lose their sight. Ah, some people lose control of their limbs. Most people die of poison. 10, January, 1891. It is now nearly three years that I've been in America. 
Wherever I go, I come across our folk from Galicia. It seems they all came here. The Poles, Jews, Ukrainians, Slovaks, and even men from Bukovina. I paid off all the money I borrowed for the journey. I sometimes send one or two dollars at home. Winters here are the same as at home. I, I keep meeting Slovaks from Butovice, John Doe and Matthias Komara. There are altogether about 20 Bukovians, but they are all like one. <laughs> Where do they work? I want to go and ask for work in the ironworks at the high furnace. They pay well there. I will have to keep feeling wheelbarrows. They fill wheelbarrows with iron or limestone or coke. As long as they don't destabilize the iron ore pile. Iron ore is heavy and falls without burning. If they aren't careful enough, it breaks their limbs and kills them. Dead man, no work. And then he doesn't need to be in America, does he? No, they shouldn't be removing empty wheelbarrows until they're all the way down. Their legs might get caught and stuck under a cage. And, you know, man with no legs is no man, just half man. Perhaps not even that. Want to try? <laughs> Will you manage? Yeah, so try. The furnace cover is called bell, like church bell. When the, yeah, and when the ore is melted, all wrecks remain in furnace. When the melted iron comes in contact with water, it causes explosion. Man is split in five pieces or more. Not a pretty sight, really, such men. In iron works, the work by the furnace that melts the iron is hard. We know it all. Hey, hey, back, back. Do you know Springler? Hersch Springler. Yeah. yeah, the Jew. We traveled together from Hamburg. Ten tons of steel crushed down on him in the morning. Where is his body? We are waiting for Crane. They will get him after shift at the earliest, perhaps tomorrow morning. He hasn't got anyone here. Where will they bury him? Trade Unionist Soapbox. A European plague is approaching like a tidal wave. A million migrants arrive in the United States every year. They want to take our jobs, our women, and our land. They will take all that is ours. Employers will take them on like a value added to their business. It's better to dish out a few dollars a month to hire Magers, the Irish, the Jews, and especially the Slavs, the uncultured lazy bums, unable to assimilate and bring the states more pain than gain. A decent American chap means less than a migrant from Europe. Authorities give entry clearance to the sick, the illiterate, penniless, who drown cheap booze and bother our decent women in public. If our authorities and police patrols are unable to stop them, we've got to place the plague ourselves. What legacy are we to leave behind our offspring? What land shall we leave behind? Well, then, brothers and sisters, are we the great America or merely a dumping ground for backward European nations? I get up before dawn. My journey to work takes me over an hour. I work 10, sometimes 13 hours a day. I leave work and the sun slowly sets. It is only every third Sunday that I get a day off. Sometimes when I am up to it, I meet my compatriots. Mostly, however, I spent the entire Sunday laying on my bunk bed to be able to face next days at work. My face is rugged from the heat of the furnace. My eyes are bloody. My skin is as rough as that of an animal. Every other day, someone dies here. Either he gets crushed by something or he falls from the height. I wonder, what if I end up like that? I'll end up here forever and no one will ever think of me. 
I will be forgotten. That is what I'm afraid of. Don't speak like that. I shall never forget you. How about your children, if there ever are any? They, they won't forget you. I tell them not to forget. And will they tell their children about Mendel Beck? They won't forget either. You're lying, Rivke. One's got to die at home. The story of the Galicians and their horses. Everyone was saying that horses are more than anything. White, black, brown, cart horses, riding horses, any horses. Horses must be fed else they die. They said dead horse is the end of us. They also said that horse must be fed before child is. A child will not plow in the field. In the spring, it won't pull cart. It won't spread manure on the soil. Too many children, too few horses. Horses will die. We shall die too. Not a horse was left in town. There was no rain. There was no hay or oat. Everyone sold their own horse for pittance at least to be used for a skin, to survive the winter in Galicia from the little there was. Yesterday, an official came. He said we were to puncture horses by the town and let them rot there as disease and poison comes. Another official said that horse meat can be eaten, that no law bans eating it. And when there is no other food, why not eat horses? We were by the town where they burned horses to the powder. There was either no meat or it was rotten, eaten by wild animals and worms. Some people said that once we put such meat in vinegar and salt, it gets better. We took parts of the horses back home and did that as they said. Who said that? I don't know. If you come home in American outfit and money, things would be better. I'm getting ready to leave. To return. Nothing holds me here. I'm sorry. It would be silly to come back here. This land is cursed. I am in the port. I am about to buy the shift cart. I see everyone looking at me. Is he leaving? Giving up? Others say, thank goodness, one last off you go. Don't stop, go where you came from. I stand in the port, all alone. I'm alone at the work. I'm alone in my room. I am lonely in America. Yet if I leave now, it's for good. I shall remain in Galicia forever. I will be repairing shoes for the peasants. Fix soles. I am in the port. I am purchasing my shift cart. Your letter arrived today. I am excited, shaking. It is a letter from America, from my brother. Some 200 people must have come over. Everyone wants to see it. I am opening the letter. It's not an ordinary letter, Rivke. You've got to come to me. You must leave Galicia. Work is hard. Speech is hard. Even bread is different. It's hard for men to be alone here without familia. Oh, woman. Yeah. Ah, I go to shop to buy American gifty. Take in hand all my things and I will swim my way back. America was and is and will be. We must find way here, even with eyes blind. We need dollary. I will take myself a shelf for books. Nobody has that at home. They will make big eyes and they will say, this intelligent man, he come from America. <laughs> I will build house with three rooms 
and I will put burnt tiles on the roof. I buy a field, two cows, and will only speak American in pub. And, and on earliest occasion, we will build crucifix by the village, where they saw us away to the sea. Let's put writing on it, to honor the glory of our Lord, built by John Doe and Matthias Komara, Americans. America! <laughs> Rivke sails to America, a woman in the water. She is calm, motionless. Man stands high above her and far away from her. I am waiting for you. In your pocket, you have three sugar cubes and ten dollars. It's more than we had back home. I shall climb the wall in the port and we will wait for the ship siren. Steel monster with three chimneys, a city on the sea, leaving behind a vague as deep as our valley. You once wrote. I can't write. My hands aren't up to it. Perhaps I just said that. I kissed our meadows, hugged a tree. I took nothing but the shifkarta and dry bread. Did right. I followed your advice. You said to take nothing else, but the steamboat to America is no Noah's Ark, though to me it is. No Ark, Rivke, but Babylon. You meet the entire world on one ship. <laughs> How will I speak with people in America? In American. How does your name go in American? Mendel. And mine? How will my name sound like? R Rifke. When I swim to the shores of America, I will be born as new Rifke. American Rifke. We shall be together. I imagine I am with American landlords, make them tea, tidy their bed, open windows to the busy street with automobiles pulled by four white horses. From the window, I see the sea and nothing behind. It doesn't frighten me. No, it is nothing. It's infinity. That's right. I am calm. I see you on the street, clad in a smart suit, holding a chic walking stick. You enter your workshop. My workshop? You have a tailoring workshop <laughs> and you have a business partner. He is a young, decent, and honest man from Galicia. He has a beautiful name. His name is Elias Roth. I shall become his wife. I imagine. The ship has docked. Everyone has got off. I don't see you. I don't see you. I lie on the water surface. Waves keep covering me like giant duvets. I barely breathe. I am a tree that has not yet grown roots. I am home to tired birds. Food for sea animals. There is less and less of me. Every day there is less of me. The stream carries me north or south, I don't know. I let myself be carried. I don't ask questions. I look west, or so I hope I look west. Somewhere out there should be my new world. Eyes can't reach it yet. I can't sense it yet. I don't know how it smells. How does its bread taste like? Or its soil? There, in the vest, there is a lady with a crown and torch. She should greet me with a song of travelers. What might her voice be like? I imagine she opens her mouth and says my name. She speaks to me in my native tongue. She jokes in dialect. <laughs> She hides me under her iron cloak. She warms me up with hot tea and freshly cooked borscht. Hundreds of coins with an eagle on the face keep dropping off her bosom. She removes my stinking dress and I enter a lake with warm water and cloud-like foam. I can't smell the scent. I lie on the water surface and the stream does with me as it pleases. Waves keep rising. I feel like being on a tall mountain from where I sense our house and parents. Salt eats away my eyes. The sun burns my skin. I no longer know whether I still have arms and legs attached to my body. 
I can't feel myself. Shavrin keeps stealing me away, sending me to all directions. I look vest. Still nothing. I am by you, Mendel. We are together at last. Can't you tell? I smell of home. Touch me. Do touch me. Rivke, back. Mendel, back. Matthias Komara, Samuel Wilder, Abraham Lendrerer, Julius Lovenberg, Artur Landau, Karl Gutmann, Stanislav Halátek, Josef Eintracht, Salomon Ehrlich, František Krasucki, Josef Schröner, Wolf Eichhorn, Salomon Lachs, Chaim Mengel, Christian Eichemaier, Adolf Lowe, Hermann Zeitinger, Enoch Baber, Josef Hojman, Ignacis Mudzinski, Josef Zrinka, Josef Mieroslavsky, Gervary Valkovinsky, Vladislav Votarsky, Jan Viduch, Jozef Ščurek, Stanislav Javorsky, Vladislav Poler, Marcel Ivanický, Adam Kostecký, Leon Skrokovský, Mikolaj Malieniak, Baruch Band, Georg Richer von Schoroner, Jozef Schroener, Mozef Zlajv Mesita, Matias Moss, Ochapovič, Fődrich, Johan Lil, Jakob Wolf, Tomas Turkovský, Hirsch Gompert, Getruda Fochtová, Wilhelm Moss, Jozef Dobrzyński, Jozef Moss, Andreas Moss, Margarete Mosová, Michalin Mosová, Karolina Mosová, Teodor Zökler, Anna Komarová, Filipus Popovič, Filip Popovič, Tomas Popovič, Listina Popovič, Adolf Volkert, Julius Neumann, Jozef Lab, Gela Jefuchs, Serafine Plaskonová, Semen Varcholák, Tomáš Rápač, Igan Sirapač, Filemon Fedorčák, Jozef Vilač, Jan Kulčinský, Kalman Haifer, Jakob Nizoliek, Matias Fredrich, Jan Čielsa. The end. Thank you. Great job, everyone. That was beautiful. We're just um, getting some of our panelists back on so we can do this talk back. Here's Pavla. He wears. Thank you so much, everyone. Do we have Jackie? Did, I don't know where. Let's see. Guys, thank you so much. That was so moving and powerful. You did an amazing job um, telling the stories of people from many years ago that apply to people today. We're gonna wait for, oh, Jackie is here. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, so I was just starting speaking and saying how amazing this play looks with your in your directions and with those wonderful actors. And uh, I'm totally overwhelmed how you told the story of these people who are long <laughs> gone, but uh, they they just are here with us tonight. And uh, maybe Jackie, if you could comment on uh, what your experience was with the play and uh, how the, the rehearsing and directing process go. Sure. Firstly, I just wanted to say thank you everyone to the beautiful cast for uh, watching them. They're just gorgeous. Everyone did so well. Um, I also just wanted to thank you, Pavla. Um, I'm a big fan of the Rehearsal for Truth Festival. Uh, the spring fling that happens now with the play readings and also later in the year in September where, where usually we would have the live shows um, coming from uh, Europe. 
Um, and so thank you for always um, putting on such a high caliber of work and in, in this time for giving all the performers an opportunity to be working and to be um, expressing their creativity. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to thank, he's not on the screen, but uh, Geist Villiers, who was uh, also a performance coach on this piece. Um, so he worked in uh, small groups and one-on-ones uh, -on with people and really uh, it was wonderful to have him. And then a, a really great thank you to Anna Niklova that you see, she made those incredibly beautiful backgrounds um, that just, I think, really enhanced the piece. Um, just so beautiful. Um, in terms of the process, I, 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 when we looked at the production that uh, Michael Dieter had done in Slovakia, um, and also when you look at the script, it's very contemporary. Um, it seemed to me when I first read the play that they had looked at um, Martin Pollack's book and had devised sections and created a very physical theater production. So when you see that work, it was, it was in the round, it was, um, they had many, um, uh, visuals and all the actors played each other's parts throughout and uh, again highly highly physical and it was um, I realized that we wanted to try to get that physicality across as well as the contemporaneous across and I think um, Anna's backdrops allowed us to have that kind of different visuality where each of the different people inhabited different spaces throughout um, that really helped us um, so that we weren't sitting in our living rooms um, which the, the Zoom format tends to make us um, do. So that really helped. And then um, all of the different performers, um, we kept trying to work through the screen, uh, work with the physicality, try to bring as much physicality so that uh, the hands can come in because we read body language more than we hear, <laughs> I suppose, the words. Um, and I think everyone just sort of rose to that occasion as well. And um, we met over a series of weekends and evenings and through the days. And um, it was really great at this time where there's so much turmoil and so much unrest to be looking at immigration and um, this uh, looking that through the years, the kind of how immigrants have shaped America so positively and at high risk, I mean, and high toll, death toll and high emotional, personal toll. Um, to make this new world and that is still happening today so the the subject matter was so relevant um even though it happens at the end of the 19th century it is it could have been happening yesterday or you know today so that's sort of um all i wanted to say um thank you again pavla thank you jackie um and before we get to the questions that please don't be shy send us more questions we have a few uh, but I also, I wanted to give a chance to the actors because sometimes there are not many questions for the actors. So uh, how, you, at first I, I, I admired your accent. So how was it, <laughs> how, did, how did that happen? <laughs> how, did you, how did you come up with them? And um, yeah, how did it feel to, did you feel that you were speaking a Slovak play or actually originally it's an Austrian, so German text, or um, did you have it in mind that it, it, it's a translation? Can you, any of you, all of you comment on that? Um, well, when I first read it, you know, uh, came to rehearsal. And so one of the first things I think I asked Jackie was like, are we doing an accent? Because for me reading it, I immediately got that sense of it, that there was there, that there needed to be some sort of accent because if it's a person of this time coming here, they're not just gonna have an American accent. You can't say the words the same way. Part of what alerts us as humans that's, that something is different and foreign is sound. And so to me, it was important that I had a sound that was like somewhat different than what you would hear every day just from people talking. You know, like right. Jackie is South African and the minute that you hear her speaking, you can hear there's a difference, you know? And so it just, there's a wealth of information that is conveyed through that. So to me, it seems sort of evident that there needed to be something, at least for me, so. I also thought it was um, necessary because these characters, just to sort of demonstrate that these characters are uneducated. 
Um, I think that that comes through uh, with this sort of choppy accented language, um, which is a big part of the story um, for, for many of the different characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree that the idea of assimilation is such an issue, um, you know, a fundamental issue. So without an accent, that's one manifestation of, you know, that, that concept. Yeah, I, I just want to add to that. I, I think it's also important, um, just in terms of the storytelling, that um, Mendel does take on this journey all the way from there to to America and going through the different accents. I think just places everything so wonderfully um, and helps him a lot, helps us understand his journey along the way. I also, um, I just would like to, and maybe there will be questions about that, but. Uh, I, I think it's a very uh, exceptional book that is uh, that that novel, and uh, so it's documentary novel, and so the characters are real. Uh, at least Mandel and Rivka are definitely real. Now I'm 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 not such a big expert, but uh, but uh, at least from what I know from the book, she she did in the end get to America and she did get married there. So just to give some hope <laughs> to everybody who's trying to achieve that maybe as well. <laughs> so Steph, if, if we can go to the quote. Mm -hmm. Great, great. All right, so we are um, taking your questions. I see some of you have already typed into the Q&A box, but please send us more. Um, so the first question I see here, and just so all of you know, all of you, uh, the actors, if you can't see, there's a lot of claps, a lot of thank you, that was amazing. Um, something, I'm uh, Michaela, you might want to translate because it's in a different language, but um, so that's, it's really wonderful. Okay, so the first question's from Gloria. Um, are the places and names real or fictional? So uh, uh, I, I believe they are more or less real, right? Yes, they are. Real all places. the journey, all the journey, I think that's real, the places that Mandal basically goes from Galicia before he gets on the, on the ship to get to America, I, I believe they're real. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then another question from Gloria, why were some actors like the sister not on the screen? I'm not sure. Uh, um, what, what what we did is when people weren't speaking, um, they left the scenes and we were only left with the people who uh, were in each of the scenes. So we just moved in and out so that, and uh, the sister Rivka, Elizabeth, who played, uh, Elizabeth played her part, um, uh, she was always in the same background. She was in that one uh, we chose as a, uh, sort of a bleak landscape. And so every time we went to her, she was there until the end when she was on the boat. Great. Okay, so this next one uh, is for the actors again. Another beautiful comment saying you're all very so talented, uh, but but I'm, I'm so sorry if I butcher your name here. Uh, Talin uh, asks how you adopted the accent. So I know you all started to talk about it a little but if you wanted to go, I guess, more in depth on how you worked on the accents and the, since there were so many of them. Um, so these are, yeah, for all the actors. I think, um, uh, oh. yeah, go for it, Andrew. I was just gonna say, I think every actor has a, has a different way that they work on accents. So I'll just speak for myself. Like for me, Russian is, it's, it's a Russian, general Russian accent that's probably not at all specific to this region in any meaningful way, but it's general enough and, um, I, I have a couple of phrases in my mind that get me, get my mouth in the right position. So like uh, when I lived, I lived in Israel once upon a time and I lived on a kibbutz and there were a lot of Russians there and they would always say to me, Andrew, listot vodka, listot vodka. <laughs> so I, I just, in my head, I'm going listot, listot. So that gives me the L and uh, it, it sort of sets me up at least in the right direction but sometimes i felt like i was busting into some italian and irish because it's not easy <laughs> when you don't um have a lot of time to work on the material 
Well, Bertha, Bertha Pappenheim is a real person. It was a real historical figure and uh, she was Austrian German. And I wanted to make sure that I did respectfully represent her accent and, and how she might have sounded. Um, but also to make sure that I was speaking clearly because that's not an accent that, um, that is natural for me. So I was trying to uh, work on keywords, like Andrew was saying, that there's keywords there that have a, a German intonation, but that also to still maintain clarity of uh, point of view and clarity in dialogue. I actually have something to add there. Um, oh, go ahead, Karen, if you want to answer that. Well, I was just going to say, we also, a lot of us, um, we spoke about how the story really resonates with our family history. So I didn't have a lot of, you know, I had one piece where I had an accent, but for me, it was really my, my family. Um, so, yeah. Oh, I love that. My question was going to be, did uh, any of you have to do an accent for the first time here? Were any of you trying out an accent that you'd never done before? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I've, I've never had to do any kind of Eastern European accent um, just because I've never been cast in. <laughs> I don't sort of um, fit the, the character description, but I, but I think it did really well um, is, is sort of cast um, just a mix of people to play different things, and, and which is great for me. Um, and to be able to do that, I, I mean, it, it wasn't easy, um, but, but it was really great to sort of explore that as an actor. That's wonderful. I, I definitely also haven't done an Eastern European accent before, and I tried, I think it changed <laughs> somewhere <laughs> during the middle of the play, and then I might have found it again, nobody knows. But uh, one of the things that was interesting during rehearsal that Gay said to me is, you should remember that whether the, the people are uneducated doesn't necessarily mean they're dumb, which is a very good note to try and keep in, 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 in the back of your head while you're trying to do the accent, because especially because it's, it's very closed and it's very, and their English is not fluent, so you speak broken English, it can very easily lead to making the character that he's dumb, but he's not. He's just not fully fluent in the language. Um, so that was something also to keep in the back of your mind practicing. Awesome. One other thing I would say is that we had a wonderful, wonderful pronunciation coach. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, so I'll let Jackie talk about that because I think that's important. That's a bit, thank you. Thank you, Michael, for bringing that up. I just wanted to say Michaela, who was, who is, was our um, narrator um, and uh, she was also the dialect coach and she uh, took the whole script and she broke it down per character, per word. And she sent everyone um, their own uh, clips and she worked with the pronunciation uh, for the whole text. And, and that was great because we, at least we had a strong anchor who actually can speak these languages. And uh, yeah, we were eternally grateful to you, Michaela. Thank you. Uh, it was just Valuable. wonderful working with all of you. Really, and you mastered the accent so well. <laughs> yeah, it was really great. <laughs> I, yeah, you guys did a great job when it, when you first started the play, I went, did they have those before? Did I? I could not fully remember um, if any of you had had those accents. So really good job. Okay. So um, the next question is, has the power base, where is the power base from during this period of immigration? And when did the immigration process on Ellis Island begin? So... That is a great question. <laughs> um, raise your hand if you feel, I'm not even sure who specifically to direct the, uh, this to, if not Jackie. Oh, Pavla, help me. Um, yeah. um, power base? Uh, Where has the power base? So um, I'm not sure I totally understand the first part of the question, the power base of the, so uh, this was the, the, the biggest, as far as I know, the uh, biggest kind of exodus from that part of the world, which is called Galicia, was um, in the 80s, 90s of the, 18th, of the 19th century. 
And uh, then I believe uh, then the, the, the novel, The American Emperor, follows the characters into the 20th century. So that's my understanding. I know that Ellis Island, that, that was when at the turn of the century, definitely they started at the end of the 19th century. And at the turn of the century, that was when it was used more, where it was really millions of people that came through Ellis Island. And I know that I, I think that um, people who were in first and second class on the ships, they went straight to Manhattan and people from lower classes were detained on Ellis Island and were inspected for their health. They were asked if they had relatives in the United States, they could help them in which cities. And uh, I think the time for staying there was a little bit different for everyone, but um, um, it's a beautiful museum and uh, it's, um, it, it, it keeps a, a lot of history alive. I mean, Ellis Island only officially closed down in sort of 1954. Um, and so, and I suppose just before then that, that they were finding different routes for immigration in terms of people arriving in different ways, namely an aeroplane. Um, so before that, I mean, this, we, we're talking a, a surge of people at this time. I mean, and they're coming through Russia. Uh, there were, you know, a lot of people were persecuted. They were coming through Russia, into Galicia, through Austria, Prussia, um, a lot of organizations assisting people to get them to America. So this is, this is a, just like a constant stream of people. And this is just from uh, Europe. Uh, yeah, uh, I hope that answers your question. I thought that was great. I learned. Um, the, the next question is, do we know why Mendel was held in Ellis Island or what the chalk meant? Well, I believe the chalk, they would put the chalk on your back if you were sick. And the re only reason they would really keep you at Ellis Island, if not send you back, is because they didn't want to introduce you to the population if you were carrying some sort of disease. So I think though maybe he had a disease and he didn't know that he did. That's the only thing I can think of as to like why he would be doing that. And I think they would also use that time when he was saying, talking about drawing, we talked about how that was them trying to teach him English. And so he was drawing the letters, trying to like learn the alphabet. So I believe the chalk was to like indicate that he was sick. And so he had to stay there until basically like he got better and then he could be let in. Yeah. Great, and in some of the research, it was sort of saying that he, he, he was encouraged to wipe the chalk off his back because he would be put on the next boat back home as well if you stayed ill. Um, so there is, is a lot of like people assisting other people saying, whatever you do, you've got to get that chalk mark off your back. Yeah. Wow. Um, the next question about the performance. Uh, so someone asked, David asked if the performance will be available online. It will. Um, and Pavla, can you answer how we're going to get that link out or where the performance will be available? So uh, we are going to put it on YouTube and uh, we will send all the participants, all the attendees of today's stage reading, we will send them the link. And it will be also on the uh, festival website. So it will be available for public. Amazing. And I think it's just for a short period of time. It's a week or something. Um, yeah. Yes. So. so share it fast. <laughs> okay. Um, how did uh, Ronnie asks? Uh, it says, "Fabulous job! This was the story of our grandparents." And how did Mendel finally get admitted to the U.S.? It's not in the play. I mean, it's probably in the book, but I haven't had a chance to read the book yet, so I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know the details either. I think when Mendel recovers um, his health and he has, uh, and he dies, he is admitted through the usual process through Ellis Island. He then moves out of the barracks, the sick barracks, and he, and he goes through the process of 
uh, going on shore in Manhattan. Great. Another fun question for um, our actors. How close or how distant did the actors feel to the characters? So, I was very excited. My grandfather immigrated here from Galicia. Oh. So it was really comforting to know that somewhere in my bloodline, uh, my, I was connected to my character. She, she, was, she lived there. So that was a really nice connect, connector for me. Oh, I love that. I would also say, well, Ronnie, who said this is my grandparents, is my mother. So ah. uh, <laughs> clearly this is like my story as well. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm 50% Polish, I'm pretty sure. And then it's other Eastern European countries. So I feel like this literally would be my story if I was alive at that time, at that age, being that age, I probably would be one of these men who would want to travel to America. So I feel like this is very much close to me. Same I, um, for me. Oh, go ahead. Me too. Same for me too. Yeah. Yeah. Our ancestors. Great. I, I would maybe just add, even uh, b before we started, Chais and I were speaking a lot to the cast saying that, you know, as we are immigrants and, um, you know, Zane and Pierre and uh, Michaela um, and Pavla and, uh, you know, um, immigration for us was easier in some ways because we had access maybe to more resources that allowed us to come through in a legitimate way. And yet even the expense, the extreme expense of, of, of some of the stupid things like when Mendel has to pay all those golders uh, to all these different people, the, these kind of go between people. And like in South Africa, when we have to come through, there's only one person that does your medical. And normally if a medical costs you 300 Rand in South Africa, suddenly, through the immigration process, it's 4,000 Rand each, and you can only go to that one person. So along the way, you are also still hit up on this immigration process with a fortune of money. And, you know, my husband, we, we had to come up with a lot of money to pay a, 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 a lawyer. So we, we came, we sailed into America on an easy route, whereas obviously every single day, the immigrants coming across the border do not have that and they also are still paying coyotes and all kinds of people exorbitant amounts of money to have a harrowing journey from where they are to here so absolutely nothing has changed in 120 years nothing i i want to add to that um i think yes like jackie says uh, we we are way more privileged in, in a lot of ways um, in terms of coming over but i mean the the visa process that i had to follow with the last eight years of being in the country is jumping from one visa to the next to an artist visa and every time you need a lawyer and you need a hell of a lot of documents and chest x-rays and this and that and to prove that you're i mean which is basically the same as they had to do it's just with better technology today um and the copious amount of money that you had to pay over the last eight years is is insane so I think that part of the immigration process and, and linking to the character is, is very, very similar. Yeah. And that's why all of you are here to do this, to do this play, right? To make it happen regardless of whether it's on Zoom or not is because the message has to get across pandemic or no pandemic. So I applaud you all for that again. Um, you, you guys are getting some hard questions. Uh, <laughs> I love it here. The next one from Michael Feldman is, was the labor union speech based on a real text and how does it relate to current debates about migration in the U S and Europe? Great job by all actors. That's what it says. I feel like I'm moderating a presidential debate. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have, I don't have any information on whether or not that specific uh, sentiment was based on a specific trade unionist or a specific um, documented speech. I know that it resonates very loudly today with the kinds of things that you're seeing and the kinds of sentiment that you're hearing um, from everywhere from the news to Facebook. You know, you're, you're hearing these, these kinds of thoughts, these kinds of fears, the, this kind of belief from all kinds of people from politicians to your family members who feel afraid 
uh, in that fear mongering type of um, conversation that happens where people are trying to tell people that uh, immigration immigrants are taking jobs and immigrants are clearly doing work, backbreaking labor. I think this play demonstrates that very well about the backbreaking labor uh, for pennies, um, which is not a job that anybody necessarily wants to have. So um, I, I, I don't, again, I don't know, I don't know if anybody else has any information on whether that's a, um, a documented speech or if it's just really very uh, closely linked to what's happening today because it sounds very, it sounded very modern, very contemporary. I'm sorry, I, I'm think, sorry. I don't know. If... Um, I think like all of the texts were from Martin's book and um, that they based it on. Um, and I think that, you know, when we were um, looking at this piece with Jeanette, we, uh, she really came with an, a very strong offer of um, making it quite contemporary in terms of a very um, a particular uh, person at this time who's very pro, uh, well, very anti-immigration um, um, and uh, very pro-isolation. So I think she was tapping into the current zeitgeist and bringing um, older sentiments um, into a modern context, but they were still sentiments from there. Um, and sadly, as we've said, nothing changes. The, the, the pe things people were saying um, it, as trade unionists then as, uh, is exactly the same as now. Pablo, did you want to add to that or? No, I think, I think Jackie really covered it. She did. Okay. Uh, okay, so the next uh, question is about the names at the opening and what those names were or who those people were. I mean, the names that you list um, at the beginning and then again at the end. So, I mean, I, I don't know if Michaela, if you want to answer this or can I? No, sure, go ahead, Jackie. Um, it, it's, it's a list of the, the family names of people from the Galician region that came through. Obviously within that list as well, we do have like Mendelbeck. Um, th these are all real people that were part of the crossing that you would find in the records of Ellis Island. It's a real list of, uh, and we cut it down quite substantially, obviously, because it's a, quite a long litany, but we did feel that it was important to top and tail this piece with honoring uh, those people that, had, that made this journey and that, uh, you know, made the iron ore and made the buildings and made the railways work. Um, th th there were, you know, huge, groups of uh, Slovaks, Germans, Polish, Hungarians that, that built the city. So were these names uh, listed in the play and you cut them down or was this a choice? Yes. By you? Okay. Yes, they were, it, it was in the script and mm -hmm. all of the names were up top. Um, obviously, a even then a selection of names, not every single last one, but a, 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 you know, a selection of the family names of people that came through. And we just thought it, it was maybe a little heavy to do them all right at the top of the play. So we sort of cut them in two, shortened them ever so slightly and, and top and tailed. Wow. I think that's great. Love that choice. Um, okay. Uh, the next question is from Joyce who asks, um, where was Rivka when she was looking west before she arrived in America? Do you want to answer, Elizabeth? Sure. I, I was on the boat to America. In a sort of a feverish state, you know, like having done the crossing with no food and no water and no whatever. So, um, yeah, on death's door. Um, the next question is from Ronnie, and it is, how was it different doing the rehearsal online rather in person? So Jackie, if you want to start, uh, I know that you talked about this a little bit in the beginning, and then we can, um, we can give it over to the actors. Um, obviously for me, my passion is live theater, and uh, Zoom is difficult for me to kind of um, do theater on because it's not theater. It's a kind of a strange other thing, it's a Zoom, which it's not film, it's not a webinar, it's not created. Um, it's, so it's a, such a bizarre um, transitional thing. Um, and we're in this very strange transitional place. 
and I always bulk against it. Like, I, I, like people ask me to review their plays on Zoom, and and I, I can't do it because of my uh, it's live, like it's not live theater, and yet it is something. And um, so it's incredibly difficult because the live energy in a room is is so always the thing that I just adore more than anything in life. When the lights go down and and those live performances kick in. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I, at the moment, I am in grief. I'm grief stricken by my lack of being able to be in a theater. Normally, I'm in a theater three or four times a week. <laughs> and I'm really struggling um, with it. And I understand that it's going to be a long time before I'm going to be able to do that. So instead of, you know, staying in anorexic land of never looking at theater, um, this is a, a way for performers, for us to come together. When we had rehearsals, it was like a therapy session as well, because we're all, um, and it always lifted my spirits. I started this morning, as I said to the cast, in an anxious rage, a frustration and anxiety with um, the America that is on fire at the moment. And I was really struggling with trying to keep my rage down and the injustice of, of people's situations. And I have to tell you that three hours later, after the rehearsal, I have to say that it dissipated because I was around beautiful, artistic, creative people that are, even in these times, reaching for their highest, um, as, the, to try to eke out the best possible performance in this Zoom environment and pushing themselves harder and working harder on the notes, not just sort of sitting back on it. And that is so beautiful and and th that's the the power of theater to to uplift us and i'm doing a long rant but that's just from me Ooh, not a rant that was that was empowering and beautiful um but uh, and maybe someone else wants to talk about the zoom as a as a performer <laughs> I'll, I'll just say i've been watching a lot of shows online and you know, as a performer, like Jackie said, the rapport with the audience and not hearing, like for me, comedy in particular, it's, I just, there's such gratification of hearing people laugh and impacting them. And with drama, you feel it's such a, an energy that is between the acting ensemble and the audience. Um, so that piece is, you know, challenging, but with film and video, this kind of, parallels that in some regard. So there were technical things that came along with Zoom that, um, you know, just were another kind of uh, different piece of the, the process. Yes, I felt very, I feel very clumsy in this, um, in this medium. And I, you know, I don't, everybody has a different technical, technological equipment, and I'm using my phone for this. So I can't, I can't see all of my castmates uh, at a time. I can only, I have to swipe through my screen to see who's talking. So um, that separates you another level from, from, your, from, your, from your cast, from your fellow actors. So there's, um, I don't know, I just felt clumsy uh, trying to toggle back and forth. And um, so that was an extra challenge that I'm not used to working with. Yeah, uh, other than the obvious, sorry, Michael. Um, just the, like the moment before the show starts and then when the show ends, just to have that physical like element with your cast, it's just, there's nothing like it. And I really thought about that today and lamented over the fact that I wasn't going to have that with you guys today, but no. it has been a joy <laughs> nonetheless. Well, what I was going to say was what's weird about this process is that for me, like to be able to read the script, cause to me, it's like, you know, you're in this little, everyone's got their own little proscenium basically, you know? So that's sort of how I look at it. And all you get is like what's happening in this box and it's very close. So it is sort of like film in the sense, in that sense, but it's not because it's live and it's theater and you're supposed to be doing your thing. But like, I didn't, I can't see any of my scene partners. You know, I have the script here and I have a little green dot. And so I just sort of look at that as if it's them and I listen and the rest has to be your imagination. So it's interesting because the, to me, the actor's job is always your imagination, but this is sort of like it on crack in a, like a weird way. I don't know. Um, so really all you have to do is like real, all you have to do. One of the things that I was doing <laughs> is just really trying to listen to what the other person was saying and really just like let that 
affect me and just try to be present for them because that's sort of like all you can do in this medium in a lot of ways. And um, as Jackie said, also, it's like you body language relates so much. And since you're not live, you're not in front of someone. It's like, how can you communicate beyond words in a medium where you only have this little box? Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, there's a lot of parameters, but sometimes with a lot of rules, you, it makes you have to innovate and have to like figure things out. So it's like an interesting challenge. I don't know if I would like to do this for the rest of my life, but it's like, <laughs> it's interesting. I also think it's, 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 it's interesting to me that like when we go out on stage, we're putting ourselves like in a state of risk because our whole bodies are sort of out there and there's nowhere to hide. And so you get nervous, but naturally, but I, I was so surprised to find that even on Zoom, even though we're in the safety of our own little bedroom, you still feel those nerves. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> it's like crazy. It's like nothing's really at risk here. I don't see anybody watching the show. I could just click off and disappear. But I can't because <laughs> I, I can't because I know like the actors, we all rely on each other to to get it done. And so maybe it's maybe that's part of what that ner those nerves are about. It's like, you know, just part of what acting is about is like relying on each other. And so I still feel that, even though we're disconnected. Yeah, I would like to join in. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. It was a different, a heightened sensory experience. I found myself um, immersed in character in a different way because of what Michael spoke about, where it's, you know, like you, Michael, I didn't ha I wasn't looking at anyone. I had my script and then I had to change the backgrounds and that, um, you know, uh, field would not minimize. So, you know, it's completely, utterly different. I'll just join on this one. I, I just would like to, uh, to add from the viewer's perspective that um, it's amazing. I was like, uh, so I put on my dress, you know, because I was going to the theater tonight. And um, I was kind of thinking, shall I clean here? Because I will <laughs> have all those guests on my computer and I put myself a drink. And uh, uh, so this is the third night and I'm getting used to it. I don't know what I'm going to do on Monday <laughs> when this is over. And uh, so I know that it must be hard for you and very, very different. But at least for me it's it's a great experience it's new experience and um it it brings the theater to my living room so again thank you for that um i i want to just add this it's a comment but i just think it's really lovely uh from gloria and it says i feel artists are the antidote to the broken government and the injustices in the world. They are a way to better a human they are a way to a better humanity. Thank you for leading the way and sharing these conversations. Beautiful. Thank you for that. That is great. That, wow. Thank you. Wow. Um, I don't know if there's a, a, any other questions, but I, I, I wanted to just uh, perhaps throw a question to Anna because we haven't heard from her. I'd, I'd really like um, her to just chat a little bit about her inspiration for the, the backgrounds, like um, what influences um, uh, helped her with the creation of them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jackie. First of all, thank you so much for letting me do this. It was uh, such a great experience. I would love to do, it was, it was great to do theater backgrounds in, in a much easier way, in a way than it would be to doing an actual stage design. Um, and I really enjoyed them. I just kind of kept reading through the play and tried to imagine all the different places that are in it. And uh, yeah, I drew them on Photoshop and I was really inspired by this uh, riso printing technique that I've been using physically that creates this kind of grain. So I used that as well in the backgrounds to make this sort of a hazy landscape atmosphere. And yeah, I really enjoyed it and I love to see it all come together. Amazing job, everyone. It was beautiful. And I, I, want, um, I, I want to add to you, too, that your backgrounds give more than just um, information as to where everyone is, but a feeling. Uh, mm. And that is so, it's so beautiful. You're such an artist because with every change, you like, you feel differently, too. Um, so it's really lovely. Thank you. Um, okay, so a few people are asking about the book and the play, about uh, what the title is. Um, 
yeah, that's that's actually the question. What is the title of the book? I, I think the, um, of course, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the, um, the original title in German. Uh, it is the Great Emperor of America, something like that in German. And um, you can find it on our website or if somebody else remembers it. And the, the, the play was adapted for a stage in 2018 in uh, Bratislava by, uh, uh, by a theater called Studio 12, I believe, Studio 15. Uh, it's, a, it's a part of the uh, Slovak Theater Institute and they got a, they received an award in 2018 for the best production, for the best Slovak production during that year. Great. Um, someone wants to know if this cast is going to be performing this live <laughs> when the world goes back to normal. <laughs> Who knows if the world's gonna go back to normal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. That would be that would be that would be lovely. Yes, we will we will try. <laughs> um, I know um, beforehand uh, when Pablo was saying that we were going to do this on Zoom, I was like, no, no, let's just wait, let's just wait. And I'm pleased that we have done it, and you know, it is something that we, you know, can look at doing live uh, reading at the Bohemian National Hall. Um, it's always such a beautiful place to, uh, when there are lovely play readings there and so I'm sure there'll be something on the cards. Sorry, I've got a, one of those demented ice cream trucks in the background <laughs> going past my window. <laughs> yeah, we had some um, neighbours who decided that obviously they're coming out of quarantine and so uh, they started a party <laughs> at some stage <laughs> while we were busy. So it, yeah, so it's, it's very interesting this platform. <laughs> oh yeah. Absolutely. Um, for uh, Talene, again, uh, you asked, will your team do more performances on Zoom? So um, I will let you answer about this team, but we do have another performance tomorrow night at seven uh, that you can go and register online for. You'll get the link again. Um, Pablo, I don't know, you'll probably, you said something in the beginning, say something in the end, but we do. We do have another show tomorrow night. Uh, so come out for that. Um, now, someone wants to know, it's anonymous, that's why I'm saying someone, uh, what, why the emperor and what does that mean to you? So if, if any of you have your own idea of what that might mean. I, I believe it was the name of, of the ship. If I'm correct, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe so. And there's also something quite interesting when I was looking at uh, some of the research is that there was a great, amazing Slovak man and his name um, escapes me at the moment. He came over to America and he did amazingly well and he really rose in the ranks politically and um, he was quite a force in America. And at some point he ended up, I think in the Philippines it was, and he was known as the American emperor. He had that... Um, title which I found quite hilarious um you know obviously obviously when he arrived he, you know he arrived with money and a, a fancy ship and he was the uh, American but uh but originally one of the um Slovakian um immigrants from the like end of 19th century so I, I quite like that <laughs> but yes the name of the ship great um, I took it to me. go ahead I just gonna say I took it to mean uh, for me, the, the title meant like these people were coming from a place, uh, the Austria-Hungarian Empire, so there was an emperor there. And so the assumption, they just only knew what they knew. So they they imagined the new world um, would have an emperor or they could be duped into thinking such. So again, it came back to that sort of that naive quality of like going to a new place that um, even Rivka says, where is America? Like people didn't necessarily know. Uh, and so they were the vulnerable, I guess the vulnerability of, of the, the characters is what struck me. And that projection of yeah. uh, royalty onto the new, it must have the same uh, hierarchical structures as where you, where you are, just with, with more money and more dollars. And so, yeah. Okay. 
Um, this is a fun question. How many countries are represented in this Zoom performance? Oh. There is a, where's everyone from? Is what I'm taking that to mean. It could also be the flag. So I'm South African. I'm South African. South I'm African. Scotland. Sorry. Czech Republic. Me too. Mm -hmm. Upstate New York. <laughs> Same. Texas. <laughs> this. Are you? And are you all there in in these places now? I know. I know, Anna. You're not. Um, but where is everyone right now? Queens, New York. <laughs> Brooklyn, New York. Me too. Brooklyn in the house. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. saw it. Washington, Lexington, New York. Malaysia, New York. Oh my goodness. We could put this on in, in person. <laughs> We're, everyone's kind of right here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Jack, for you, how did you do the casting? Um, I cast everyone I love very, very deeply. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, like if we were going to do Zoom, then I, I wanted to be surrounded with people that I absolutely adore and um, who are also br brilliant, beautiful performers in their own right. Um, everyone on the screen I have met in various guises and, and done various shows with or been involved with them in my personal life, um, on stage, in productions. And um, I count everyone on the screen as, as uh, uh, people that I really really adore whose company i enjoy and when i think are just exceptional individuals and i include my husband if you want to there he is look yeah, hello oh. <laughs> she oh, has yeah. to say that i'm sitting right here no, I'm <laughs> and, uh, also because he's he's new to the screen he uh uh is um mm -hmm. he was also the performance coach uh, co-director on this uh, um all the beautiful moments you saw i, I think were largely his doing along with the actors, obviously. So. Magic. And he's South African. I are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so this is our last question. And it's a doozy. Um, so <laughs> Tammy, what do you all think is the kind of work available today that requires skills that everyone might not have but are so important to opportunity in the same way that fluency, fluency in English was such a powerful advantage. And I think that all of you can actually, if you click the Q&A button, I think you can read it if it makes, uh, maybe. I, I think there's, there's different uh, parts to that question. Um, I would say, um, I've said this before, a lot of different countries, and a lot of different cultures um, have different forms of theater that require different skill sets. So for example, um, a huge drive in South Africa, one form of theater that's very popular is physical theater, where you have to have a real um, ability to work with the physical body to be able to make sounds. And that form of theater came from poverty. There's no lights, there's no theater, there's no costumes, there's no money. So you need to make theater from what is around you you need to be able to tell a story that can hold without uh, electricity. Um, it came out of a, a form of, of South Africans um, expressing themselves physically, basically. So within South Africa, I would say I've encountered a lot of theater makers, people that can, they act, they sing, they write, they direct, they can do like rig lights, they can, um, so they don't specialize. Not everyone, it's a broad generalization, but I'm just saying one form that happens in South Africa. When I worked in Prague with a friend like Mizhenka Chekova, and the, the kind of work that I see a lot um, from people in Prague um, or in the Czech Republic tends to be very contemporary, highly stylized, beautiful multimedia screens, highly conceptual. The artist, the author, the director, like, that, that visionary is, is very strong. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily do classical text. They're constantly looking for the different conceptual way of, of, of um, making work. When I came to America, what I found was that the word is king. 
the word is absolute king. This, it's, everything starts with the script and you pay homage to that script. The writer is everything. The director will not change a single word of that text because it is sacrosanct. Whereas in Europe, the director is king. They're expected to take that same script and cut it up into 16 different ways and bring a new vision. So depending where you are at and what the ask is and what that current vibe is, you need to upskill in a different way. So if you were trying to um, work in perhaps in uh, Europe, you might need to up your skills of understanding multimedia, how to work with projections, how to make the relationship between performers and multimedia really buzz. Maybe if you're in Africa, you've got to learn to upskill yourself in a lot more areas. And maybe if, you, if you're in the States, you're going to really need to know how to specialize, like to be able to hit that note of the writing. That's just an outside perspective. I don't know if it covers it. That's over to the next person. <laughs> One of the ways I interpreted uh, the question was about um, in this play, how not speaking English was a hindrance and how that really affected people uh, when they came over. And I think now the way that we're moving forward is with technology. So if there are a lot of people that don't have up to date, up to technology skills in this society, that that might be the kind of work that's going to be really difficult going forward. And I know, I think when you, when you have an age gap with people who are not used to dealing with technology, obviously there's socioeconomic gaps if you cannot afford certain equipment. Um, and I think that that's kind of um, a reflection where in this play, it was about whether or not people could speak, whether or not they could read, whether or not they could communicate in English. And I think in now, this particular time, if you're not uh, able to work with technology, you might also really find yourself struggling. Yeah, absolutely. Does anyone have anything else they wanna add? I, I just think that in general, being South African, we're very lucky in terms of that we grow up at least bilingual or trilingual. Mm. So moving to a different country, you don't think of it necessarily as an advantage that you have for the, purely the fact that you speak English, because that's how you grew up and you would just switch between languages and that's what you do. Um, but I realized the first time when I moved to London and then I was in Europe for a while before coming to the US, that there's, there are a lot of immigrants that, from all over Europe that go to London and they only go with purely the reason to learn English. And the advantage that you have speaking English as an immigrant in a country definitely helps you, I think, in, I mean, being an actor, you need side hustle jobs. And if you weren't proficient in English, you would have much shittier jobs being the side hustle type of thing. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. So I, I definitely think that's the, the fact that you're proficient in English makes a big difference. Mm. Absolutely. Okay, well, that is the end of our questions. Um, Pavla, I will throw it over to you to end, but I also just wanted to say thank you so much uh, to everyone who asked these questions, the audience, to the cast, to Jackie, to all of you. Uh -huh. It's a really, really amazing job. Very thoughtful answers to every question. Um, and I loved it. Pavla? Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, thank you, uh, amazing cast. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful night, and uh, I can't wait to see you in real. I hope sometime soon. Maybe let's meet for a beer where they, when they open the uh, Czech restaurant in Manhattan. So yes. um, uh, stay strong. You'll be back on stage or at whatever you'd love to do. I'm, I'm sure about that. Thank you, Stephanie, for, for all your help. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, see, you, see you soon, all of you. Thank you, all the attendees, for staying with us for so long. Uh, please come back. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Safe Thank winter. You. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you for everything. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Stephanie, we stay on here, right? We can stay on? Uh, no, so I'm going to end. Um, I'll end it and then it's going to end for everyone. Great. So everyone else, we can join on a, that uh, uh, other link from Saturday. If you just want to go in there quickly, I'll send the link to Pavla and to Stephanie if you want to join. Thank you. All right.
Voilà, c'est ça. Ben, ben, 